Hello, my name is Carlos Pasquale, Senior Vice President for Global Energy and International Affairs at IHS Market. Welcome to these Sierra Week conversations that are brought to you by IHS Market. They give us an opportunity to have these conversations with thought leaders in industry, in government, in academia, in geopolitics, in the worlds of finance. These are exclusive conversations that give us insights on the challenges faced in the energy sector at the time of the COVID pandemic, but at the same time that the energy industry itself is going through an extraordinary transition. Today, we're going to have a conversation that focuses why, in this context, the Middle East matters. And it's my pleasure to be able to have this conversation today with Suzanne Maloney, a friend and colleague for many years. Suzanne is the Interim Vice President of the Brookings Institution on Foreign Policy Issues. She's had a career in government. She's worked in the energy industry and has capacity to look at these issues from many perspectives. Her most recent book is The Iranian Revolution at 40. Suzanne, welcome, and it's a real pleasure to have this conversation with you today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to discuss these issues with you today. So just a, a quick note, what Suzanne and I want to do is take you on a bit of a journey. We'll start on the near-term issues, on the geopolitics that are behind the oil price war with Russia and Saudi Arabia and how that involves the United States. We'll go into some of the longer term conflicts and crises in the region and what their importance is. And of course, we're going to touch on the external actors. But Suzanne, if, if I can start with the backdrop to this, in 1985-86, Saudi Arabia went through an, an experience in which it flooded the oil market globally. What did it learn? Tell us a little bit about that experience and why is it doing this now? I think it's good to cite these precedents because what we're experiencing today is unique in many respects, but we do have some past history that will help guide both the understanding of how this will impact markets and also the understanding of how governments can and should respond. And the experience of 1985, I think, is a really important one. At that point, the Saudis were frustrated with their role as the uh, swing producer, effectively having cut their production nearly in half over the course of several years to compensate for overproduction and quota busting by a number of other OPEC partners. Uh, the Saudis, looking at a region in turmoil, at that point, Iran and Iraq were locked in a war that was having broad consequences, not just for the security of the region and all of the neighboring states, but also, of course, for energy transportation and markets, because uh, both parties to that conflict were beginning to target oil tankers and other marine traffic through the Persian Gulf. The Saudis at that point opted to ramp up production to oversupply the market in a determination to reclaim market share, to force other producers to begin adhering to their quotas, and to essentially uh, reclaim its position as the king of the oil market. It had the intended effect. In, a, in effect, other countries were forced to scale back production to try to compensate for this Saudi gambit. And it had devastating economic impact on some of the Saudis' most foremost adversaries, including the Iranians at that time. But it ultimately boomeranged in a way that was very consequential for Saudi, the Saudi economy, for Saudi politics, and for the geopolitics of the region. I think it's important to note that even at that time, President Reagan dispatched Pre Vice President George H.W. Bush to plead with the Saudis to try to scale back production because of the concerns of the impact of this uh, gambit on, the, at that time, the, the West Texas oil patch. The Saudis were unconvinced, and uh, we know from this experience that it ultimately did have a, a catastrophic impact on the traditional American oil industry, and one in which uh, I think we can look today to see some very important parallels. It's a fascinating story, and the parallels are quite striking. And I wonder, Suzanne, do you think at the point in time of early March when the Saudis and the Russians um, broke apart in the OPEC Plus alliance. Did they have a recognition or an understanding of the devastating impact that COVID-19 could have on global economic growth and demand for oil? 
No, I think that it, in early March, it was impossible to appreciate just how quickly demand would crater, just how widely the coronavirus would shut in economic activity around the world, and how dramatic this impact would be not just on energy markets, but of course on, on broader financial markets as well. We knew at that time, of course, that the pandemic was moving from Asia into Europe, that it was having a uh, beginning to have a global reach. But I don't think that there was a really real capacity on the part, particularly of the Saudi and Russian leaderships, to appreciate how fast this would move and how uh, dramatic the impact would be all around the world. So my guess is that this was a decision that was taken without a full appreciation of where the situation was likely to, to head over the course of subsequent weeks. So the impacts have certainly been sufficiently deep and dynamic and, and painful that what we're about to see in the next couple of days is that the OPEC plus group is supposed to meet in um, virtually, I was about to say in Vienna, um, virtually reflecting the times that we're in, that the G20 is going to meet virtually the day after that. And um, I don't want to put you in a position of predicting what will happen or not happen before, um, since we're having this conversation before those events. But take us into the politics behind these discussions. What are some of the critical political issues that are going to be of concern to the Saudis, to the Russians, maybe even to the United States as this process unfolds? I think you just named the three most important actors in the way that this plays out over the course of the next few days. There's a recognition widely, of course, across the industry that we can't go on as we are indefinitely, simply because there won't be sufficient capacity for storage. We're coming very close within a month or two to maxing out that capacity. And ultimately, that will force the shut-in of production around the world. And so the question is simply, who uh, jumps first? And so we're in a game of chicken uh, between a Saudi leadership that has in the past undertaken relatively reckless foreign policy maneuvers uh, and demonstrated a, a sort of headstrong approach, whether it's the blockade on Qatar or the war in Yemen, an unwillingness to back off even when it's clear that the sunk costs are, are far too great and the strategy that's been chosen hasn't been successful. I think they're matched in that with, by uh, Vladimir Putin, who uh, has been boasting of his ability to ride out low oil prices, but is being tested, of course, by the prospect of oil that may fall to historic lows if this crisis continues. And of course, the third major actor is the United States, which has a, a, an enormous stake in trying to find a way to stabilize uh, energy markets and to ensure that the broader impact on financial markets doesn't continue and impact the prospects for President Trump's reelection campaign, but has far less capacity to control the individual actions of producers who are independent from the state, as opposed to the situation in both Russia and Saudi Arabia. So. My, my guess is that there will be pressure on all these parties to try to come to some kind of an acceptable conclusion where there are some cuts, but I'm highly doubtful that we're likely to see the level of cuts that would be necessary to really be responsive to the fall in demand. And so my guess is that even if we see some modicum of success as an outcome of both the OPEC plus convening and the G20 convening the next day, that we're going to remain in a situation of highly volatile oil markets, which will then have a broader negative impact on the global economy. Some of the projections that we've seen on the reductions in demand for oil on average in the second quarter of 16.4 million barrels a day is what we've been projecting at IHS market. Um, whatever is done probably isn't going to be enough to uh, eliminate that accumulation. If, if that's the case, we still are even in the best case scenario, going to see huge downward pressures on oil prices. How does that affect Saudi's, Saudi Arabia's aspirations for transformation internally? Well, I think the, the really ambitious plans and frankly, the very necessary plans of the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, are already uh, very much in, in a position of, of being compromised by the politics of the, the policies that he's undertaken over the course of the past few years. The increasing hostility with some elements of the American political establishment, 
Um, that has largely come from the Democrats, who've been highly critical of the Saudis over the war in Yemen, as well as over the assassination of writer Jamal Khashoggi, is now going to be matched by frustration that is emanating from Republican circles, traditional Republicans, uh, who are mobilizing to try to utilize the high, high degree of dependence that the Saudis have on American military assistance and military presence in the kingdom to try to put pressure on the Saudis to uh, uh, change their, their posture on this oil policy. I think you know, the longer term financial implications for the Saudis are, are quite devastating. This is not a, a kind of small oil shakedom anymore. This is a country with a large population that really needed to undertake the diversification that Mohammed bin Salman has been evangelizing over the course of the past several years. But we haven't yet seen the kind of structural change that would be necessary and the resources to undertake that to do some of the grand projects that he had proposed, as well as to ensure that the uh, domestic constituencies that are important to the stability of the Saudi regime uh, had enough resources themselves. That's the, the financial resources simply aren't going to be available to, to undertake the very ambitious campaign that he had uh, in mind. And I think that we are looking at a future for Saudi Arabia, which is increasingly, for domestic, political, and economic reasons, increasingly compromised. Stan, so let's move to uh, another topic, which has been a big part of your professional life and your personal life as well, which is Iran. How crippled has Iran been by COVID-19? Well, Iran was one of the first hotspots outside of East Asia for the virus to spread. And this was largely a function of the very high degree of dependence that the Iranian economy has on its relationship with China, particularly since President Trump walked away from the Iran nuclear accord in May of 2018 and began imposing increasingly crippling sanctions on Iran. As a result, the Iranian leadership was loath to acknowledge the virus spread even in January as its own health ministry was calling for a curtailment of travel and trade with China. That didn't happen for weeks. And in fact, even as it was known that the virus was beginning to spread around Iran, the government was unwilling to try to impose some constraints on movement uh, in part because they had very and a very important set of elections that were taking place in mid-February. And so what we've seen is that the, the virus has reached the very highest levels of the Iranian government, uh, as well as prominent members of the reformist proto-opposition that exists within Iran. Uh, the Speaker of the Parliament is the, Ali Larajani, who is likely to be a candidate for the presidency of Iran when elections are held early next year. Uh, is in fact uh, the latest to come down with coronavirus. A number of senior officials have been diagnosed and recovered, uh, but we can, uh, I think, see that this is going to have a very widespread effect on Iran's basic economic functioning. Um, the difficulty that the Iranians have is that they don't believe that they can withstand a, a very severe quarantine, and so the country has just returned from a three-week national holiday associated with the Iranian New Year. And it really is business as usual, once again, in many parts of the country, high levels of traffic, shops reopening, business uh, is, is being undertaken almost as normal, even as health ministry officials are anticipating as many as 500,000 Iranians may have contracted coronavirus. And the possible uh, death toll is going to rival that of the Iran-Iraq war. This will have long-term implications on Iran's domestic capabilities, and I'm sure on the, the, the political and economic prospects for the country. Wow, that's, that's stunning. Um, it, just given what we've learned about the importance of, of social distancing and containment and, and being able to contain that, the disease. What are the implications for Iran's regional engagement? Does this dampen it or does it make a difference? What's ironic is that we've seen a higher degree of, uh, I think, capability on the part of the Iranians around the region on the presumption, I think, that the United States is distracted and or unwilling to take more uh, aggressive actions as President Trump did back in January 
when uh, the assassination of the commander of the Quds Force, Qasem Soleimani, nearly brought the two countries to a state of war. Um, the Iranians have been uh, escalating through proxies in Iraq. We've also seen new activity of rocket strikes by Houthi militias against Saudi cities that are beginning to have casualties. And uh, we've seen very little in the way of a response from the United States. The President, President Trump tweeted last week a warning to Iran. Uh, we've seen some consolidation of American military presence in Iraq to try to ensure force protection. But I think this is only emboldening the Iranians. It's very possible that even as the virus has a, a very devastating effect on Iranian society and on the future of the country, that Iran will emerge from this period in a stronger strategic position in terms of its own regional posture and its own influence in neighboring states. Wow, so you've taken us through Saudi Arabia, Iran, you've brought in Iraq, you've folded in the issues related to the United States and how it's relevant. Maybe let's take the next jump to Syria. Um, what can we expect there, a country that's really held in this balance of tension that is also fomenting destruction? What happens next? Unfortunately, I think Syria remains in the vice grip of Bashar Assad and that the major players in any future uh, Syrian reconstruction and Syrian political engagement are going to be those players that have been prevalent during the civil war, that being Iran and Russia, first and foremost. The real risk, of course, is that as the virus spreads across the region, um, what happens in Iran doesn't stay in Iran, and we're already seeing evidence that COVID-19 is taking root in other countries, particularly those where Iran has uh, considerable travel and engagement. And one of those is Syria, the country that's already been devastated, whose health facilities are minimalistic at this point, having been targeted by the regime itself. And I think it's quite likely that as this virus uh, begins to take hold in countries like Syria, moving into Lebanon and elsewhere, that we're going to see a, a devastating human toll and inevitably a new wave of migration that would be impacting Europe as well. I'm gonna ask you to do the impossible, but I've known you, I know you've done it many times in your government career, giving quick reactions on, on huge questions. The Middle East peace process, where does this take us? We've seen that the Trump administration launched a major initiative on Middle East peace, but it really has gone nowhere. I think this is characteristic of some of the initiatives that Jared Kushner has undertaken, even before he became our corona czar. Uh, he uh, was tasked with this, and we saw very little in the way of progress. The only possible silver lining is this recognition that these two populations are so heavily intertwined and that the, the kind of threat of a pandemic that really doesn't discriminate on the basis of national origin, religion, or any other factor may force some sort of recognition that there is a, an, a, a necessity for cooperation and for a solution that respects the dignity of all people. OPEC, what happens to it? My guess is that OPEC will have its ninth or tenth life. Um, OPEC has a sort of uh, minimalistic utility to all the players, and so uh, it will remain, I think, a, a structure that exists. It's never really been a cartel in the sense of dictating either price or supply. The, those decisions have been made by the member governments. But what we've seen is that there is some capacity to, for OPEC to engage at least uh, for brief periods of time uh, with non-OPEC producers, and that's going to become an increasingly important aspect of its utility of the, as an institution. And if we then look at outside actors like Russia and China, do they increase their influence in the region, and, and, and will it move in the same direction? Is there an alignment between Russia and China on how they might see regional developments in the Middle East? I don't think there's an alignment, but I think both see an opportunity as the United States begins to retrench its position, largely because of American public opinion on both sides of the political aisle that is no longer supportive of maintaining large military presence or extending large expenditures of, of national budget on the Middle East. Uh, there will be new opportunities for both Russia and China China more on the economy, Russia more as a strategic partner, 
But that doesn't mean that the, re the region is somehow lost to the United States. I think the important historic, political, and cultural influence of the United States, the, the role of the American economy uh, will, will continue to ensure that the United States has a stake in what's happening in the Middle East. And we'll have to find a new way to uh, employ our influence that isn't simply through the vector of military presence. And are we ready to do that in the United States over the, the coming months that we have in front of us? I think that's the debate we need to be having. What does it look like to try to shape a better future for a critical part of the world that doesn't rely on hubristic understandings of what we can do in terms of societal transformation or what we can do through the arm of our military forces? Um, the United States has long been a force for good in the Middle East, both in terms of society and economy and politics for many years. It's really only over the course of the past 30 years that we have defined that so narrowly through the lens of the number of troops and the battles that we are engaged in. We need to broaden the definition, we need to expand the conversation, and we need to acknowledge where we have limitations, uh, both in terms of our capacity and in terms of our budget. And a uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, one of the things you've made clear is that market share is not new to the issues and the challenges of the Middle East and how it's handled in, in the present is going to be a critical factor of whether it deviates from the experience of 85, 86, where it was so had such a devastating impact on conflict in the region and on the economies of the region. Certainly the issue of the pandemic is one that doesn't know borders. Um, perhaps conflict doesn't know borders in the, in, in the Middle East as well. And we may see more of that. And the players are shifting. You've really brought a focus around that kind of change of interaction and relationship among the players. But an opportunity for the United States, if it's willing to look at this and ask the questions, how can you use effective and creative diplomacy and engagement to retain the interests that we have because in effect, what we do see is that this is a region because of its economic importance, its energy importance, its impact on commodity prices, on our friends and relatives and neighbors, um, that this is something that we have to take seriously. We really appreciate your willingness to discuss this, Suzanne, and uh, it will be a pleasure to keep joining you in the future conversations that we have through Sierra. Thanks so much.